uh, uh, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, uh, very good morning to all of you. I am delighted to welcome you once again to uh, IES Big Ideas Distinguished Speaker uh, Series. As I guess all of you know, we have uh, started uh, this uh, series some uh, three years ago, and we had the pleasure and the privilege to hear from uh, heads of the states, ministers, CEOs, thought leaders uh, around the world. And those speeches, those discussions helped us to discover uh, new perspectives, shed light on uh, emerging issues, and uh, in many cases, they did challenge our uh, current thinking. Today, uh, we are honored uh, to welcome a man who has been internationally recognized to the very highest degree for his contribution to economics, energy, and climate. Professor uh, William Northaus, who is the recipient of the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economics and currently the Professor of Economics at Yale University. Professor Northaus uh, dealt with many issues as uh, one of the leading modeler, energy modeler of the world and the climate model of the world, but at the heart of his recent contributions to the international uh, debate was the economics and the cost of uh, climate change. He looked at the interplay between economics, energy, and uh, uh, climate change. And uh, his work has been a great inspiration for anybody who is interested in the issues related to economy and climate change. We are coming here just from a meeting that the uh, International Energy Agency has organized for the uh, some 250 brightest energy models around the world where Professor Northaus, together with the Dr. Yumkela uh, here, gave uh, very inspiring speeches uh, to the people, uh, to the uh, energy uh, modelers. And we are uh, now uh, here going to uh, listen his perspectives on uh, climate change. Where are we today? What are the challenges in terms of the institutional challenges in terms of what has happened in Kyoto, in Paris, and what are the next uh, steps. As you all know, at the IEA, uh, in addition to energy security and the access to energy, we take uh, the climate change and environmental issues uh, very seriously. And our work at the IEA has also benefited the, uh, the, the great work that Professor Northaus uh, carried out over the uh, uh, years. Now, uh, I know uh, uh, Bill uh, several, uh, since several, several years, and I know that he is a, even though he's a, a great brain in terms of the modeling, energy and climate issues, he also would like to see that his models, his work, helps to change the world in a, a better way a, 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 a dimension that I greatly uh, appreciate. Now, uh, Professor uh, Northaus, as they all do, uh, gave an excellent speech uh, when he received the uh, Nobel Prize, the acceptance speech. And I read this speech. There is one uh, a quote I want to underline. He said, there is a need to forge international institutions that will promote cooperation around the world. And I feel confident that the IEA is one of those organizations, and we will continue, to, uh, continue our efforts to live up to this uh, very challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great uh, pleasure, uh, privilege, and honor for the International Energy Agency to host uh, Professor Northaus uh, here with us. And I would like to invite you to join me to welcome Professor Northaus. 
Hello, it's a great pleasure to be here. I feel uh, it's a kind of reunion today here in Paris because uh, I did I did much of my early, actually I was a student in Paris uh, in, in college for a year. Um, then, actual, then I spent many years at the International Energy Workshop uh, doing all kinds of academic work. And actually, during two years of my life, when I worked in the administration of President Carter, uh, I spent many a happy day and a few frustrating days at the OECD. Uh, so it's, a, it's a nice to be back in the chateau and to see many people. Uh, here uh, in in that uh, in this beautiful beautiful building. Uh, so what I'll talk about today is some of the challenges that we face in climate change. I would like to start, however, by just by putting the work in the larger context of what we face. Um, we face many challenges at a global level of global what are known as global public goods global challenges, um, some we know well, some we are emerging ones, These, some that go back many years, such as armed conflict, others that also go, go back many years, such as the issues of trade and trade negotiations and trade conflicts, and then the more modern ones that we know about, such as the one I'll talk about today of uh, international environment and particularly climate change, and then emerging threats that we're just beginning to recognize and really have not dealt with at all being threats in the cyber realm. But those are uh, just four of the many issues that we face in the international community. Uh, and the one I will focus on concerns with energy, concerns energy and climate change. As you know, climate change is uh, not a new discipline. It was not suddenly invented in the modern era, but goes back to uh, 1896 when its first scientific discoveries took place. And then the work in s the scientific aspects, the geophysics, atmospheric chemistry, oceanography, glaciology, has been work that has really gathered force over the last half century. Uh, through the work of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, we have seen reviews, a set of five reviews, which have gone through the science. Uh, I doubt if anyone in this room, and maybe no one in the world, has read every word of those, because they would go on more than the encyclopedia, but they are encyclopedic, and they do contain the knowledge of the scientific communities from all the different areas about where we stand. And what they sh show is with incre increasing confidence that we, we are changing the world, climate is warming, it's because of human influences and particularly because the emissions of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, which in turn is caused primarily by our use of energy a topic that is very much on the minds of the International Energy Workshop and the International Energy Agency. So what I want to talk about today is how do we go about bending down that curve of growing emissions? How do we actually contain the climate, the, da the climate change and the damages that come from that? First thing I would remind us, I'm sure all of you know, some of you are even have been negotiators perhaps in this, is that we have a long history of climate, international climate negotiations going back to the Framework Convention of 1994, the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, and the most recent being the Paris Accord. Now, those are all based on what I call the, the voluntary collaboration or the, vo or the voluntary coalition model of international agreements where countries agree to a certain set of steps, certain national steps, certain international coordination to reach common goals. But it's also what you might call a coalition of the willing in the sense that people make commitments and they follow them 
but there are no pen penalties if they don't. So I think a good example of this is what I call the red light, green light convention, which is in all countries I know, red means stop and green means go. And it's a good, it's a, it's a costless convention in a sense. It doesn't, there's no penalties if you don't do it, but it's good to have a convention so when you go from one, one country to another, you don't go through a green light and get hit by a truck because in that country, green means red and red means green. But climate change is not like green lights and red lights. Climate change is something where we need to take steps as countries in coordination to meet ambitious goals, but they're also costly. And they're ones where there are incentives to free ride in the sense of to promise to take large steps and not to take steps or to, internet or to negotiate an international agreement like the Kyoto Protocol and either drop out as the US did and later Canada did or not join at all as many middle and low income countries did. So the Kyoto Protocol, the, the Copenhagen Agreement, the Paris Agreement are all in the model of voluntary agreements. Now the result of that, if you look at the data, and I won't show you any data today, but if you look at the data, is there's been no break in the trend of the car decarbonization of our global economy. The amount of CO2 per unit of global output has been declining about 2% a year for about 40 years, and that has not changed. It didn't change after the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen Accord, or the Paris Accord, and if you look at the pledges that have been made under the Paris Accord, it looks as if it's not gonna change in, in any dramatic way in the near future. The IEA reported the 2018 emissions, which are rising moderately sharply, and in fact, the continue, a continuation of the trend uh, of the carboniz decarbonization of the last 30 or 40 years. So the problem is that these are agreements that are without any consequences. And so what I would, they're what I call a coalition, but they're, a co they're not a club. And so what I have, um, with other people, we have done some modeling at Yale University where we would like to, what we've analyzed is what is called the club model. Now what is a club? Uh, all of us belong to some kind of club, I'm not just a hunting club or a tennis club but actually nations are clubs, firms are clubs, families are clubs. A club is something where there's a common service that's provided, where there are benefits to members, and where in the club you can exclude people who don't pay the dues. So you get benefits, you pay for those through some kind of dues or contributions, and if you don't pay your contributions, you can be excluded. You don't. And, that way you can avoid the free riding that might occur if you didn't exclude people who are non-participants. So what we need to do, the primary point I would like to get across today, is we need to move from a mental model of climate change agreements, from a model where we have voluntary participation with goals, targets, and timetables, but no penalties for, for countries that do not participate to a model in which countries participate, they join a climate club, they pay dues with ambitious abatement targets, and they are penalized if they don't meet their targets. Let me just be specific to give it a kind of concreteness for you. A particular club, just to get it started, would be something like the following. You would have Countries get together, it could be all countries, could be a large number of countries, could be the e EU, the US, China, Japan, um, other countries. And they would pledge as part of the agreement to have domestic carbon prices at a given price, say at least $50 a ton. They'll tell you how to get the carbon price. Could be a cap and trade system, such as the European system. Could be a carbon tax, such as some countries have. 
but whatever it is, you have to have a minimum carbon price in your country to be a participant. Not emissions targets, which are just unwieldy, but carbon price. Those countries who are in the club, in the agreement, then are in the agreement. Those who are not, what is the penalty? The penalty would be trade sanctions. The trade sanctions would be levied by members of the club, that is members of those countries that had um, reached the targets against non-participants. So it's a little bit like the EU with a common internal tariff, but with, that, with an external tariff wall. This target would then get more ambitious over time, and how ambitious it could get would depend on certain technical parameters and technical factors. But you could ramp up the carbon, say $50, you could ramp that up over time to meet your targets. But the main point about this, I'm going to talk a little bit more about trade, but the main point about this approach is that it would be something where there would be incentives for countries to join because that would avoid the external tariffs. There would be incentives for countries to participate and take costly abatement to avoid the penalties. There would be a kind of network effect because the more people in this club, the more incentive there is to be in it and the more incentive for, for countries who are not in it to join in. Now you might say, is this a crazy new model? No, it's not a crazy new model. Is this something we've seen before? Yes, we have. If you look at some of our most important international institutions, they're based on this model. And one of the two examples, just to give you, one would be the WTO, which is based on the model that you have pledges, and if you break your pledges, then you can have retaliatory tariffs. Another one is the EU, where you have a common internal market, common mar in internal market, and those outside don't, cannot share in the common internal economic structure. So those are examples of clubs, and we see, I mean, the EU is an interesting example because it's costly to be in it and it's costly to be outside it, but the two countries that have uh, thought about leaving the EU, one being Greece around 2010 and the other being the UK now, are facing this terrible dilemma of in or out, and they would like to be out in some regions, maybe out of the Eurozone because it's, it's too costly, or maybe out of whatever it is the, the British think they're getting out of. But when they actually look at it carefully enough, they realize that this is very, very costly. This is a club with so many benefits that we, we, we are only going to leave it uh, with careful consideration. So those models, the WTO is one model, the EU is another model, there are other models as well, but those are models that capture the basic point that you have a club with, with obligations, whether it's budgetary obligations or trade obligations, but it's costly, it's, it's benefit to be in it, but it's costly to leave it. That's the model we need to adopt for our climate, international climate agreement. Moving away from the voluntary model to the club model. Uh, let me say a little something about the tariffs. That's, this is probably, aside from the whole idea, which is uh, a very radical idea and uh, not one that would be easily adopted <laughs> overnight because it's such a new and radical idea. But let me say something about one technical side of it, which is the tariff side. So uh, what about the penalty tariffs and what kind of penalty tariffs might you, might you consider? So many international, many countries and many uh, proposals for trade sanctions against non-participants, say you have an internal, such, this has been a proposal in the EU for countries that don't have a carbon tax or a carbon price for imports into the EU, there would be countervailing duties that were against the goods based on the domestic the EU carbon price plus the carbon content of the import. So this would be a standard countervailing duty kind of uh, arrangement, and we this is well known to trade theorists, and virtually all countries have them and have used them at one point or another. That is not what I would be proposing. There's a certain technical reasons why that's difficult 
but the main reason is it's ineffective. It's too small, it's too complicated, it's too difficult to administer, it requires going too deeply into the input-output matrix to figure out how much CO2 is in the steel, it's in the cars, it's coming across the country, or how much is in the machines, in the steel, in the machines that use to build the robots, that build the cars. So if you think of all the different complexities of getting into all the direct and indirect CO2 content, it's just a, a nightmare. So those people who've looked at it this, usually just shake their head and say, let's just do the first round, let's just do the direct effects, but then those that turn out to be very small. So what I propose instead is something much simpler, which would be just a uniform tariff on all imports of, of goods, probably not services, but say oh, could be goods and services, but those are too complicated, so let's just stick with goods uh, into the country, into the club region from the non-club, from the non-participants. And you could have tariffs of, we've experimented in our modeling from zero to 10% uniform tariffs against all imports. Zero being what we have now, that's the structure of the Kyoto Protocol is zero tariff against non-participants. The structure of the China, of, of the Paris Accord is zero tariffs on non-participants. And the point is, any modeling will show that if you have zero tariffs, it's not gonna be effective. You need to have one, two, three, four, five percent tariffs on imports to make it effective. So we've done some modeling. We've, um, of an ideal arrangement, um, and we've, we've found that you can be pretty effective. You can have effective and you can have growing effectiveness of this over time if it's well, if it's well designed. So let me leave it there. I just want to summarize the key point I'd like to get across. Um, I suppose it's appropriate to be in Paris and to say that the Paris Accord is deeply flawed. I mean, it's maybe no insult to Paris or to the people who negotiated it who were following in a long tradition going back to the Framework Convention. But the basic mental model of the Framework Convention, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement uh, is flawed because it's based on voluntary agreements. And we know that voluntary agreements for global public goods have always been shown to be ineffective. You need some kind of incentive, you need some kind of sanction for these kinds of prisoners' dilemmas to be effective. The only one in the climate change area which really is practical and has a size enough to be effective for as costly and important a problem as climate change would be trade. And so a linkage of trade and climate is really the key to solving our climate change issue. So I think I'll leave it there. I think these are issues, I think it's, I, I couldn't think of a better place to discuss this than in this forum with people who are um, diplomats, experienced negotiators, energy experts, trade experts, uh, people who deal not only with theoretical issues but with practical politics and trying to implement them. And in the international arena, where they, this is an international problem, this is not just a national problem, this is an international problem. And so I submit that to you for your consideration and thank you very much for the time. So, uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, wonderful, inspiring, to say the least, a uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, speech uh, from uh, Professor Northaus. Now, as we always do, uh, we are going to get some uh, questions from uh, the floor in the perhaps group of uh, two or three, and uh, Professor Northaus uh, will uh, address them. So, who would uh, like to uh, start? Yes, please. If you can get your phone, yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, speech. It's uh, very inspiring. Uh, just a question on um, your club. Once countries are in it, then you'll also have to make sure that they comply. I mean, in a way, you can ask them, 
you can ask concessions and commitments when they enter. But when they're in it, it's not so easy. I mean, we have the Stability and Growth Pact in the EU, and then to say you're in the club and you're not complying is not so easy. How would you suggest to deal with that? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. My, my name is Laszlo Varu. I'm the chief economist of the International Energy Agency. Uh, my question is that some key low carbon technologies reach the technological maturity uh, that they are now cheaper than fossil fuels without any pricing of externality and without any carbon price. But the technologies who did achieve that, wind and solar, uh, wind and solar photovoltaics, are not copy paste replacements in a smooth microeconomically defined supply curve. They are fundamentally different technologies. They generate only electricity and they do it in a variable fashion. So we need to transform infrastructure and we need to transform the capital stock of industry uh, and transport to enable uh, the energy system to use these technologies. And I wonder that what is your advice that how we should approach carbon pricing in this new world of technologies where the, where the task is no longer uh, to plug a cost gap, but the, but the task is to transform the infrastructure. Okay, why don't we go? I, I, I think these are two very, very deep and interesting questions. So rather than go to another question, I think I'll answer these first. So I, I think that when people ask me, what are some of the problems with a climate club? I say, well, look at the growth and stability pact. <laughs> actually use that example of one where it's actually quite difficult. Well, I think actually the growth and stability pact problem is, is more political than measurement problem. Um, my, my own view is I think we, we, for most countries we can measure GDP, for most countries we can measure debt, sometimes not always perfectly measured. But I think, I think it's a real issue. I, I'm just inclined to say this is, this is a technical issue. And it's a technical issue of measuring the carbon price in an individual economy. Uh, I think the OECD would have, I would just round up, um, I would engage uh, experts from the OECD who I'm sure could find uh, workable ways of doing this. So I, I do think it's an important issue. I, I, don't, I don't think it's insurmountable, but I, I have, I, I just, this is one of the three, four, five, six problems that it would raise. But you know, all these, all these kinds of issues, international agreements always have these kinds of technical problems where you have to get some, some I mean, measuring tariffs, this is a similar kind of thing. What is, it, what is a tariff, how is, it, how is it measured? I mean, you've got to rely on people to see whether other countries are actually um, meeting their trade obligations. So I, th I, I agree with you, that's, that's one, of the, one of the issues. Um, I, I do think that once you, once you get going, and particularly if you have something like a carbon tax, um, then it's a pretty transparent institution have a carbon tax. Now you can say, well, it's not really transparent because of subsidies, but it's a start. So one of the things you might say, well, I wasn't going to get into this, but I, I'm personally agnostic as for this arrangement or whether you want to use cap and trade or carbon taxes. But then if you say, well, our technical group would come in and they, they from the OECD and they've examined this and they say, actually, the carbon tax is much more transparent and so there would you'd get maybe a, a green light for a carbon tax and come back to the green light, and then an orange light for cap and trade and like a, a flashing red light if you used some other kind of arrangement. So I, I do think this is something that uh, my own view is it's workable, but it's, it's not trivial. I would agree with you on that. Now on the question of um, renewables, so I have a couple of points. It is very clear that the cost of renewable electricity has fallen very rapidly, as, as best as we can measure it. Um, in some areas, it's competitive with fossil fuels, but in other areas, it's not. And also, it has some load characteristics that are a little complicated, but that's a different question. But it isn't competitive in some of the other areas, such as fuel for air, just to give an, an example, fuel for aircraft, um, or... Um, some other heating sources, and uh, so I, I would agree with that. This, but I've got two points here. One is, if in fact renewables were becoming super competitive, then we would not see the rise in carbon dioxide emissions that we've seen. So part of the problem is that we've seen this rapid rise. So 
they might have risen more rapidly, but we haven't seen a sharp inflection point in CO2 emissions in the last five, 10 or 15 years. So that's an indication that yes, they're becoming competitive, they're becoming competitive, but they're not yet driving out fossil fuels. But at the same point, I'd like to add another important part of any climate, uh, international climate agreement is the need for what you said, which is very rapid technological change in this area, continued rapid growth in technologies, improvement in technologies of low carbon fuels. This in turn will require three things. First, it will require higher carbon prices. That's actually the most important ingredient to developing low carbon technologies and low carbon and fuels is high carbon prices on fossil fuels, which will give incentives to everybody in the world to do it, not just to a few. Secondly, we need government support for the fundamental science and the developmental science in this area. And then the third, something that I don't often mention, but since you did, I think is absolutely important, is there are big network effects here. And we need to take into account the big network effects as we build out our infrastructure, particularly in rapidly growing economies and rapidly growing communities, to make sure that the infrastructure that we're developing is not one for the 19th century or the 20th century, but for the late 21st century. So that's a very, so all of the, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that requires thinking across many, many different dimensions. I don't think, the, so just a final point, I don't think these will be terribly expensive if efficiently managed. So part of the point, of one of the reasons that I particularly think a carbon tax is a very good instrument here is because it promotes efficient reduction in CO2 emissions. It raises revenues. Many of our governments are starved for revenues, so it's, it's a good tax rather than a bad tax. And it promotes the kinds of technologies that will help us make a transition to a low carbon world. Thank you very much. Uh, before going to second round, j let me support your argument to affect uh, maybe uh, some uh, 30 years ago, some of you, I am sure you remember, and we have the Norwegian ambassador here. There was a former Norwegian prime minister, Mrs. Brutland. She made a report called uh, Sustainable Development, so which brought up the sustainable development concept for the first time. It was exactly 30 years ago. And one of the main issues was through recommendations to governments, policymakers, to reduce the share of fossil fuels in the energy mix. And 30 years ago, when this uh, uh, the, the, the movement started, the share of fossil fuels in the energy mix was 81%, 81%, 30 years ago. And in last 30 years, many things happened. Renewables became cheaper. Technology became much more modern. Uh, politically, uh, many, many uh, uh, green elements of in almost every political party in the world. And as a result of that, this a and many agreements, Kyoto, Paris, this 81% 30 years ago today reached to 81% still. No change. So uh, this is the realities of life. And it is the reason why uh, we think at the IEA, it is, of course, pushing the renewables, giving incentives to them is very important, one of the bedrocks to fight against climate change. But uh, we need other instruments and other technologies to be part of the uh, game. Now, going back to the second round, there is a question uh, over there. And uh, yes, sir. And followed by the young lady over there. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alex Robson. I'm the uh, OECD uh, ambassador from Australia. I uh, just uh, had a question on um, uh, your approach, uh, Professor Nordhaus. We've seen uh, in the debate about trade tensions recently playing out uh, the question of incidence of tariffs. So some people, uh, I think you know uh, who I'm talking about, would say that uh, the incidence of the tariff 
as in seems to be in your approach, falls on the, uh, uh, the country where the tariff is being imposed against, whereas other uh, people like the IMF and others have seem to have gathered evidence that there's a substantial portion of the incidents which falls on the country that's imposing the tariff. So I wonder in, in your model and in, in your modeling, uh, what assumption you, you make there, because it seems to me for it to work, it has to be the former view that would apply rather than the latter. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm an intern here at the OECD, and uh, thank you very much, Professor Nordhaus, for your intervention. I would like to ask, um, so we are seeing the rise of uh, some figures and some activists in uh, leading uh, public movements for um, climate change, but we're not seeing, also because of the sensitivity, sensitivity of the issue, um, political leaders and policymakers actually taking a lead on these issues. Do you think that uh, climate the ideas, climate clubs, would be possible even without strong uh, political leaderships, or do you foresee uh, the rise of some leaders that are taking the lead in this sense? Thank you very much. Good over to you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll start with the trade question. Um, so. So in preparation, so the, the work I did was published in 2015, first published in 2015, and probably was reflected work uh, for about five years. Uh, that's that's the life cycle of a <laughs> an idea in academia, um, six times as long as a baby. So uh, in doing that, I reviewed the work on the incidents of tariffs, uh, and the work I looked at was of uniform tariffs, the, the, the incidence of specific tariffs on specific industries is more complicated, and all the work uh, that I reviewed uh, found that the uh, incidence was primarily uh, on against the country on which the tariffs were levied, which had negative effects, and were favorable to the countries that levied the tariffs. So the reason is that it is true that when you levy, let's say the US were to levy a 5% tariff against everybody in the world, um, that the this would raise the price of imports and would hurt consumers. But there's what's technically known as the terms of trade effect, going back, this is actually goes back to John Stuart Mill in 1848, so it's not a new idea, which is that the relative prices, in particular the prices in the home country, the exporting country, go down. And the prices in the exporting country go down more than enough to offset the tariff effects. Um, the work I would, so there are, I think, four detailed uh, studies of this, computable general equilibrium models. The one I relied on was by Ralph Osa in the University of Chicago and published in uh, 2015. And it, it shows, these are not huge effects, but, for, but you found that for tariffs up to a substantial level, in his case up to 50% tariffs, that the benefits, there were benefits to the country that was levying the tariff. So the, the reason this is uh, counterintuitive is because most analyses just look at the first round effect, which is the effect of the tariff on the, the prices coming into the country, but they don't look at the real exchange rate. And so what generally tends to happen is the real exchange rate adjusts sufficiently to offset that and um, provides benefits to the tariffing country. I'm sorry to go on this long about it, but it's a really, it's an important subject. I should say that that modern theory says that that needs to be revisited and because it doesn't take into account sufficiently financial effects, but anyway, that's where economics is at the present time. So that's, that's what I relied upon. And I'd say there was, there was no contrary evidence using econometric models, 
computable general equilibrium models, imperfect competition models. So on the question of uh, who's going to lead, um, I mean, I think it is absolutely clear that at some point the political leaders will have to accept the importance of climate change and be willing to uh, accept the kinds of steps that are necessary. I think it will be a lot easier if they are convinced that they're doing this together rather than individually, that they're not going to be subject to being uh, uh, gamed by other countries who make commitments and don't keep them. And so I think the kind of agreements that are in the club type agreements are kind of reassurance that when a country takes expensive steps and other countries commit to similar expensive steps, that all countries will meet their commitments. So if we use the WTO as an example, what has happened if you, just a little bit of history, if you go back to the 1930s, tariffs in our country were much, much higher. They were in some countries 30, 40, 50 percent of dutiable goods. And now in most of our countries represented in this room, there are two, three, four percent of, du of dutiable goods, tariffs of dutiable goods imports. And that has been, uh, through a process of negotiation where of recipro recipro reciprocity. The idea being that I will commit to do something, uh, you commit to do something, but if either one of us violates our agreement, then there are ways that we can um, retaliate against it. Uh, so that is the structure in which you have comfort that what you're doing and giving up something that you think is of value to you will, and somebody else is giving, is, is making reciprocal agreements that you're not going to be concerned that you won't, you'll be less concerned that you'll just be, um, uh, that you will be ambushed and surprised uh, and that they will undo it. Thank you very much. Uh, last two rounds, the uh, Brazilian ambassador followed by the Danish ambassador. So once you establish the club, the incentives are clear, as you mentioned, and uh, the tariffs would apply. But to get there, you need the countries to accept. And if you're talking about uh, a uniform carbon tax or carbon price, um, I understand that that would affect differently countries with different uh, energy matrices. And therefore, the incentives for them to negotiate that would be very different. How, how do you have you thought about it? Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, you mentioned in your in your presentation that this is an idea that you first presented some four years ago, um, and um, that the gestation period had been quite long. But after the birth, how does the toddler then do? Uh, what's the what to pick up uh, of political leaders on the idea? How do you think that it's doing? And, and do you see the political climate changing towards this idea? How is it doing in the kindergarten of Mr. Trump? <laughs> um, so let me come to the first question. So it is clear that um, different countries have different incentives because they have different carbon intensities, they have different costs of reduction and so on. And actually the modeling, we, the Yale modeling we did took that into account. So what we found is that com that countries have different incentives to join or they would, let's say, vote for different carbon prices. So it might be that uh, India would vote for a high carbon price because it, it would be very damaged and has low emissions. And South Africa would vote for a low carbon price because it has high emissions and low damages. So that's something we've taken into account. Um, What's surprising, to me anyway, what's surprising is even the least enthusiastic, by our modeling, least enthusiastic country would want a relatively ambitious regime. And that's because the projected damages are sufficiently large and the advantages of a club with universal participation is sufficiently large that um, even countries that had thought they were relatively invulnerable. When they looked really carefully, they'd find that, that this was actually much better than the alternative, which is doing nothing. So it's not, it's a question of are we going to continue down the current path where we're really doing nothing, or are we going to have something that has some teeth in it? 
uh, that will be effective. Now, obviously, countries have different different vulnerabilities and different costs, but even the least vulnerable would want some kind of club that would help reduce the vul vulnerability. Um, with respect to the Danish ambassador, uh, I'm reminded of uh, I'm remi reminded of the comment that uh, was made to President Nixon on his visit to China uh, when he asked Chinese leader, uh, "What do you think of the Ch French Revolution?" And he said, "It's too early to tell." All right, so. Um, I would say it's too early to tell. Perfect. Uh, so I will get two more rounds to questions. Yes, please, over there, and uh, gentlemen over there. Thank you, um, Professor. My name is Fianna Jordan. I'm a senior policy analyst at the OECD, and I work a lot with developing and emerging markets. And one thing we hear a lot when we go over there is, you know, why are we being asked to clean up the mess by the developed countries? <clears throat> so I was wondering, how do you um, take into account the role of the developing and emerging markets in this club, and, and how do you deal with that argument? Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen. Stamatsko Kotuzas from um, the Responsible Business Contact Unit at the OECD. Um, to what extent does your research um, look into the distributional effects of the trade-related uh, proposals? Um, that would probably determine the appetite of constituents to um, um, to go for a, a climate club in the developed world, and then um, uh, retrospectively on poverty and um, inequality, what, what would that mean um, domestically in non-adherence to the club? Uh, th these are very good questions. So let me let me start with the second one. The ideal club would have no trade restrictions because everybody would be in it, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. But I think if you do have some countries that are not in it, I, the main point is that these are not enormously high tariffs. We're talking about tariffs, three or four, f uniform tariffs, three or four, five percent. So these are tariffs that are far below what we saw 20 years ago, and on the order of, um, and, and far actually far below what we see in many countries today, uh, in the order of magnitude of what we see in most, uh, say, Western European, well, in the EU, the U.S., and Japan today. Uh, but the, I, the point about this would be to have a club that had very high participation and therefore you didn't need, you, you relied on trade sanctions the way, the way you re rely on weapons. You have them, but you hope you never have to use them. Um, the role, so I would say then the other question was the role of the um, developing countries, middle income countries, poor countries. Um, well, there is one reality here that we have to face, and that is we will not solve the climate problem unless we get virtually all countries to participate. Let's say you were to say, okay, we're just gonna get the rich club to do it. Well, the rich club um, members of the OECD, to, you know, I suppose those are, that's the rich club, uh, that's basically gonna solve a small part of of the climate problem for technical reasons, but also because the emissions are increasingly coming from the low and middle income countries. So a solution has to involve virtually all major countries. It doesn't have to involve maybe 95% of emissions or 90% of emissions, not 100% of emissions, but a very substantial result. Now, how are you going to compensate low and middle income countries for their burden? Well, okay, here's, maybe we'll need to, and that could be part of an agreement, but I would like to just make, come back to carbon tax and make a plea for countries to think about this as part of their fiscal structure. A carbon tax is a good tax. It raises revenues while reducing global harms, but also while reducing domestic harms. It reduces domestic harms, for example, from the pollution of fine particulates from that comes from burning coal for electricity. So this is something that there, there are domestic benefits in terms of 
the pollution reduction, domestic benefits in terms of the funds to for public goods and public services, whether they're health or energy infrastructure or educational infrastructure. So this, I would say, even if there were no climate problem, the carbon tax has a lot to uh, recommend itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last uh, round of uh, questions. There is a question uh, here. Yes, over there. Mm, thank you, Professor. I was just wondering how this will interplay with the WTO. And it's a bit related to the other questions. What will happen if maybe in this club there is, not the, there is not the same membership and in the other ones, and that then you will raise the tariffs to the members of the club that are not member, that are members of the WTO, but not members of the club. And this will go against the MFN, the most favored nation obligation that is being understood like the cornerstone of the multilateral trading system. And now that the WTO is under distress, and there has been a lot of pressure on the organization on how it functions. A proposal in this sense, in this sense, wouldn't be, will be more putting more pressure precisely on the multilateral trading system. Thank you. Uh, last question: Who would like to? Ask it? Yes, please. Actually, actually, about the characteristics of the club. Um, it was a small point. I mean, clubs grow organically. And I was wondering whether or not there's, in the modeling work you had done, there was sort of a, a minimum viable club size at the beginning. And secondly, whether or not any particular countries uh, were necessary members of that club in order for the incentives to work over time. Um, let, me, let, me go, let me go backwards in, in these two questions. Um, so. First place on how we're going to get from here to there to the club. I mean, I, my usual answer is that's not my expertise. Okay, I just, I'm just, I'm just trying to say where we need to go. It's like there are many, many roads to get to Rome, and I don't know which one is the best one. Um, but from a technical point of view, I think it's pretty clear that you would start with uh, the EU, which already has a kind of club and has a program in place. You would need to have the U.S which would have to be part of this. Uh, you need to have Japan. So that would be your starting point. And then you somehow get China in. And then once you've got those, I think our modeling suggests you've got, you've got the necessary critical mass to build the rest of the club. Now, you might say, you might be just sitting there laughing, getting the US involved under the Trump administration. Well, you're allowed to criticize your own country. I, don't, I never would criticize another country but I will criticize my own country just to say uh, all of our countries go through dark times um, and you all are from one country and you've had your dark periods and so this is our dark period, but it won't last forever and maybe a year and a half, maybe five years, I don't know. But once we emerge from this dark tunnel we're in now, then we'll have someone who is, uh, believes in science believes in economics, believes in rational discourse, believes in international institutions, realizes the importance and viability of these institutions that we've built up so painstakingly over the last two centuries. So I think at that point then you could think of the US uh, being part of that. Many, many people in the outside the current Oval Office um, know that this is a critical problem believe it's a central goal for the United States. So uh, just to say that uh, the, once we get out of the dark tunnel, whenever that happens, then I think those three beginning regions then add China, and, I, and then I think you've got a viable club. I do think it requires, it's gonna require some political entrepreneurship among some leaders of major countries to say where we're going, I mean, we love the Paris Accord and we love the Kyoto Protocol, but these are not leads. It's gonna, re it's gonna need the leader of a country to say you know, that we're, we need to press a restart button on our climate negotiations. And let me come back to the question on uh, trade, which is actually related to this question, 
I couldn't think, you couldn't think of a worse time to bring up a treaty based on trade retaliation than in 2015. Um, but again, that won't last, the, the, the problems of the chaos in our trade regime won't last forever. Um, so, but this is some, this is a really good question because the structure I've proposed does not fit in naturally immediately within the way we currently view the rules of the WTO and most of our trade treaties. So the clean way to deal with that is to have climate amendments that would have a climate treaty of the kind we have, have suggested in coordination with climate amendments to the WTO agreements that allow this kind of agreement and rule retaliation against it uh, out of bounds. So that's a utopian scheme, but I think if you actually want to think about it, that's where you need to go. Now, a shortcut, which I'm told by WTO specialists is not ridiculous, would be to just say, have a ruling of the WTO with the accord of the major countries in the WTO that th this, is, this is allowable and retaliation is not allowable under some new global public goods theory that somebody would devise. Uh, but I think that that's a kind of messy way and you'd have to get involved in litigation. But the cleanest way would be a set of climate amendments which would parallel and reinforce a international climate club treaty. So thank you very much. Uh, if I may, a uh, last question uh, from a very, very uh, innocent one. So uh, there are many colleagues from IEA here, uh, experts, and we also benefited from your speech in the uh, morning. And if I were to ask you, if you were to give a one piece of advice to IEA, IEA colleagues, to me, to my colleagues, you know, we are an organization of, we are an energy organization. We look at the energy data, energy analysis, policy recommendations, but climate change and energy are very uh, close to each other, such as the air pollution, energy security. If you were to give a one single piece of advice uh, to us, uh, Bill, what would you uh, say? Well, I, I don't know. I, I would say first, I think you're doing a wonderful job. And I think my main piece of advice is, is to keep doing what you're doing, which is to realize that the energy problem and the climate problem are part of a bigger problem, which is what you mentioned, sustainable development, but more importantly, uh, the project of increasing human well-being, human welfare, while protecting the natural world. So we're not doing the climate, we're not, I don't address climate change because I, somehow I spend all my time with, them, with thermometers. Uh, it's because those affect human activity on a, across a, a wide range of activity, a wide range of sectors. And some of the kinds of work we talked about today, such as energy access in developing countries, access to electricity, access to clean indoor f cooking fuels, that's part of your mission as well, and very appropriately so, because that's part of improving the welfare of a billion humans. Uh, so I see this as part of the broader agenda. And so we are, in a way, uh, technical analysts trying to figure out in these very, very complicated areas, whether it's climate change or it's pollution or it's indoor cooking, how we're going to redesign our systems, how are we going to redesign our fuels, how are we going to design our, our infrastructures, what kind of tools and techniques we're going to use uh, in these narrow sectors. Uh, so I'd say my main advice to you is keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, to finish it with a, such, such a holistic perspective is very much appreciated. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please uh, join me uh, to thank uh, uh, Professor Nortas, 2018 Nobel Prize winner. Thank you.